Hello, I'm back again, and today I wanted to discuss my thoughts on the history, lore, and overall narrative of the Elysian military in Ruby. Throughout the show, the fandom has had a lot to say about them to be sure, be it their heroism in V2 and 3, or their more antagonistic role in later seasons. And, given past experience with other properties, I think that we can say for sure that RT has a unique take on military and fiction, often identifying with the soldiers on the ground, but being critical of the military-industrial complex and those in power. The purpose of this video will be to reflect on Atlas's history and how it played into the modern day and recent volumes, which means we're going all the way back to the Great War. Ironically, despite losing, this was probably Atlas at their most influential. Their alliance with the Mistrali Empire had shifted far more into the direction of Mistral serving as a mere client state to the Atlesian nation. This is a given thanks to the Atlesian anti-emotion policy being instituted at least among the lower classes. They and their ally were also expanding across a third continent, extracting resources from Vacuo, and while eventually checked by the alliance of Vacuo and Vale, it was only with a secret weapon that they were eventually defeated. So our historical introduction to Atlas is that of a powerful state with a heavy focus on the acquisition of resources and client states. We also know that despite hopes for a shift in a new direction when Atlas was raised into the sky, it quickly became a haven for the types of people who held power during the previous regime, as well as the military, with Atlas ignoring popular convention and keeping their own rather than agreeing to the unilateral hunter system. Following that, we have the Faunus Rights Revolution. We don't know when this took place, though my best guess is when Stark with teenagers with figures like Sienna, Kali, and Gira serving as adolescents in the revolution, but that's heavy hint on the headcanon. Regardless, we know this war was centered around an attempt by human dominator nations, i.e. all of them outside of Kirikawana, trying to effectively deport all Faunus to Menagerie, an act that would have been genocide by proxy thanks to the Grimm and Starvation. We also know that the human nations, including Atlas, lost this war, and for a time had to acknowledge and respect the newly formed diplomatic organization, the White Fang, as a result. However, this, like many things, didn't last, and it was back to business as usual on the world stage, which eventually led to the rise of Sienna Khan and the White Fang shifting into a paramilitary guerrilla fighting force. One that enacted raids to liberate chained faunas, assassinate figures who they deemed guilty of crimes that would go unpunished, and stealing resources from organizations closely tied with the Elysian military. By the time Cannon rolls around, the White Fang have been operating in this manner for five years, and under competent leadership, show no signs of slowing down or losing popularity. As it stands, Atlas had little to do with their eventual dissolution, with it instead being tied to internal power struggles, corruption of several major figures, and rejection by their own people. You can see more on this in my IRA White Fang video. But it wasn't all bad. While one can question the political wisdom of surprise dropping a huge chunk of your army on an allied nation's doorstep, or with charging in the vague direction of a hidden enemy base with no subtlety, the Elysian military did indeed help a great deal in Volumes 2 and 3. We see this in particular during the breach, with their forces being caught in and helping contain and clear out Grimm, and in Volume 3 by aiding in the evacuation, though we also had stark reminders of their limits when Huntress-level threats were able to decimate their numbers. Due to suspicion cast upon them by the hacking, which I don't hold against them given Watts' previous rank and presumed dead status, the Elysian military pulled out of Vale. By the end of Volume 4 and around the beginning of Volume 5, they also withdrew their forces from Mistral after coming to the conclusion that Salem would be targeting their next. This is also when we see the leader of this military resorting to intimidation and veiled threats to a former ally and friend when challenged on his questionable use of political power. Cordovan's forces were overall portrayed quite positively, showing bravery in the face of overwhelming odds and even the local commander being willing to adjust her plans and reflect on her decisions when pressed, though not before some truly spectacular chaos. Volume 7 is the first time that we see the Elysian military on their home turf. They are primarily stationed on Atlas, with their forces in Mantle being insufficient given their commander has been secretly taking resources meant for the sea's defence for Amity and they are framed and viewed more as an occupying force, even supplanting local law enforcement. When ordered, we do indeed see Valor during the evacuation, however we also see Atlas's ideal of loyalty being rooted in hierarchy and obedience to authority in the army's willingness to abandon Mantle, especially given many may have hailed from the city. Given the nature of military training is often rooted in the sort of collective thinking and ingrating obedience to counter poor discipline on the battlefield, this might be expected, but it's worth noting. It is in Volume 8 when we see the Elysian military deployed at full force. We also see terror in the ranks by some when faced with their own commanding officer and a willingness to shift to a new plan when presented with one, thou be it only by someone who is already in the military and political hierarchy, independent or bottom-up counter-thinking was not demonstrated, which is fairly common based on my own research, not unheard of, but uncommon. 
As to their performance against Salem's forces, well, their efficiency in deploying should definitely be noted, though the effectiveness of their troop formations could be seen as questionable given the outside of context nature of this threat, I'm willing to count that as a neutral. All in all, while having shown competence and valour, especially in evacuations, the Elysian military was rather demonstrative of the result of many styles of military training, where obedience is concerned and were often more effective at fighting their own people than their enemies. One thing I'd like to remind viewers of at this point is that the Elysian military has been living in a time of peace. We have no knowledge of Ironwood's past experience with large-scale warfare, and that in the last two instances of large-scale warfare, Atlas lost and has shown no signs of countering the White Fang during the modern day either. Based on past performance, the minimal systemic change, and even the author's own statements, I very much feel the portrayal of the Elysian military is consistent and makes sense, especially given the culture the writers hail from and the commentary they would be aiming for with their kind of work, both past and present. Thanks for tuning in!